Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And this is James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to another important episode of The New World Next Week. NewWorldNextWeek.com gives you everything you need, audio, video, the links, the RSS feed, the archives, and so very much more. And if you are enjoying the archives, you'll know that just last week, we did something kind of special here, and we called it Good News Next Week. And I think the response, James, and you'll probably agree, has been so positive that we want to somewhat continue that and begin this new episode of The New World Next Week with even more good news. And like many folks said, but I'll even call out another person on Twitter at Dunno What a Say, please, please do good news at least once a month. I believe it's necessary to hear the positives for a positive negative balance, and I believe they're right. So one positive news story we'll begin with, James, came via email to us both via Miles Davidson, who is actually in the area where Met Gasco's gas exploration well delayed after thousands of protesters block entrance to the Bentley site. This coming from the Sydney Morning Herald, about 2,000 people gathered to block the path of miners on a rural property north of Lismore, Lismore on Monday morning, this in New South Wales in Australia. The protesters want to prevent mining company Met Gasco from starting exploratory drilling for gas in the area. Organizers said the numbers had swelled from just 200 to 2,000 people literally overnight in anticipation of the mining workers moving onto the site. Now, James, this is a developing story and the, the numbers have, have peaked and valleyed several times. And there's a beautiful video to go along with this asking the question, will you show up? And I think ultimately this shows that people power works. James. That's right. And on the note of people power and ecology, I would like to uh, point people to a, a story that just came out from localorg.blogspot.com. It's one of Tony Cartolucci's uh, network of websites talking about the spark. Uh, introducing the spark. The spark is an interesting and ongoing grassroots project that fits in well with an older article featured on local org, org titled Decentralizing Big Retail. And basically the gist of this is that it's part of a an open source ecology movement that I think really brilliantly cuts across all of the, the partisan lines of whether you believe in the global warming myth or you don't, or whether you believe in the uh, the value of uh, becoming independent and getting off the grid or not, I think this is one of those solutions that cuts across all of that and basically just goes down to, to what this is all about, the brass tacks of getting off of the global enslavement grid. And they have some very innovative ways that they're doing it, including open source ecology, basically sharing um, the, the plans and blueprints for, for farming tools and things across the world instantaneously, free for download. You can start implementing it in your own home today, and there's there's a nice little documentary that goes along with this showing some of the results that that's happening in, in various places as this gets implemented. So another, I think, positive people power story right there. And like we said, there there were several others and we'll continue to to ask for your good news submissions using hashtag New World Next Week like other folks did over this past week, James, on Twitter via at Futures Calling. There's now a flying wind turbine that doubles as Wi-Fi, which you could argue just as you were saying, brings information to folks all around the world. Our good friend at Brock West, Japan and U.S. fail to move closer over TPP before Obama visit. That's a little bit of good news. To Toyota becoming more efficient by replacing robots with humans. That story submitted at Ray Vahe, while I won't get into the positives of automobile manufacture, Humans replacing robots is, is a positive thing. Climate scientists ridicules UN report as junk. That comes via at Lex Naturalis 314. And James, I'll even throw in my last one from the Good News Network. Soda sales rapidly declining across the U.S. They are down 20% since 1998. Interesting, and that is a positive sign, so hopefully that trend will continue right down to the basement floor and 0% of people buying their toxic crap. But on that note of less and less people buying what uh, the uh, the mainstream is selling, well, we've talked about, we've charted the decline of the MSM here on New World Next Week for a few years now. We've, we've uh, co covered it a few times, the declining viewership and sales of newspapers and te television. And just another sign of that effect and that phenomenon comes from Science Daily uh, just out last week. Do you always 
always agree with the topics newspaper editors choose to cover, basically talking about a new study that uh, that shows uh, that, in fact, yes, most people actually want hard news, whereas editors are always trying to feed people with, uh, with sports and celebrity gossip and fashion and entertainment and crap that people actually don't want. So I think that's positive in the sense that more and more people do realize that the MSM is trying to feed them garbage that, and that's uh, just polluting their mind. And that's exactly why people are tuning out of MSNBC and CNN and all of these places have record low viewership numbers because people don't want the crap that they're selling. You're absolutely right, James. So that concludes our, our good news sequel, if you will, and we will do our best here to continue to bring good news to you because it, it is real and it is happening and it's important, I think, to, to focus on it from time to time. James, our second story this week, I think will continue the, the good news theme. And there is a breakthrough technology converting seawater into fuel. The bad news is it's for the Navy. The U.S. Navy believes it has finally worked out the solution to a problem that has intrigued scientists for decades, how to take seawater and use it as fuel. The development of liquid hydrocarbon fuel is being hailed as a game changer because it would significantly shorten the supply chain, a weak link that makes any force easier to attack. The U.S. fleet has a U.S. has a fleet rather of 15 oil tankers, military, and only aircraft carriers and some submarines are equipped with nuclear propulsion. All other vessels must frequently abandon their mission for a few hours to navigate in parallel with the tanker, a delicate operation, especially in bad weather. The ultimate goal is to eventually get away from the dependence on oil altogether, which would also mean the Navy is no longer hostage to potential shortages of oil or fluctuations in its cost. Vice Admiral Philip Collum declared, It's a huge milestone for us. U.S. experts have found out how to extract carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas from seawater. Then, using a catalytic converter, they transform them into a fuel by a gas-to-liquids process. They hope the fuel will not only be able to power ships, but also planes. That means instead of relying on tankers, ships will be able to produce fuel at sea. The drawback, James, as far as they're concerned, is only one. They're going to have to wait another 10 years before this is available, James. I think it's also important to put the damper on the idea that this is somehow some sort of uh, free energy process or, or getting energy out of out of seawater uh, because uh, the inputs into the system are still more than what you're getting back um, it, with the, the splitting the electrolysis to get the hydrogen and the, the uh, oxygen separated and then the catalytic converter to get the gas into liquid form. There's still a lot of energy going into the process. What this is really about is basically uh, these ships becoming self-sufficient without needing that oil supply chain. They can continue doing it as long as they have, for example, a nuclear reactor that uh, that can supply the energy to to start the process going in the first place. So it's not about you know energy from nothing, but I mean it is I suppose a positive story in if it were in some abstract reality in which this was not being used for the navy and its military purposes. But unfortunately, we are here in that reality, and that's why I think this is ultimately not a good news story for anyone who's concerned about the ramping up on uh, military tensions and naval tensions like here in the Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. So, James, we'll just include as a couple of related stories via at the second going who submitted some positive news stories for us last week. A, a, a similar thing in this press release, Blacklight Power Incorporated announces sustained production of electricity using photovoltaic conversion. And I will not even try to explain how that goes. But of course, as all these cases, James, we supply the links for folks to go do the research for themselves the other news, the Navy is quite busy. They're also going to test a futuristic super-fast gun at sea in 2016. So having said all that, James, we'll move to our third and final story this week. And it's doomsday. Four blood moons. Does the alignment of Mars, Earth, and Sun mean the end of the world is nigh? And we only use words like nigh when we're talking about apocalyptic, biblical end of the world, right, James? We'll take this from express.co.uk, who notes that just, I believe, last night, April 8th, 2014, Mars, Earth, and the Sun all aligned a rare opposition of the planets that only happens once every 778 days. Not so special, exactly. But what made that event so remarkable is that it recurred 
occurred precisely one week before everyone on Earth will see the first of four dark red blood moons, an extraordinary event some Christians believe represent the end of days and, of course, the second coming of Christ. But according to NASA, also a highly unusual tetrad, that is the four successive total blood red lunar eclipses, each followed by six full moons, will indeed start next Tuesday, tax day, April 15th, and finish on September 28th, 2015. The incredible alignment has only happened a handful of times in the last 2,000 years, but remarkably on each of the last three occasions, it has coincided with a globally significant religious event. Pastor and author John Hagee from San Antonio, Texas, has of course written a book on the phenomenon. He believes it marks the dawn of, quote, a hugely significant event for the world. Now, James, let's get to the heart of this and why you and I want to talk about this, what, what has happened in these previous times. The first tetrad since the Middle Ages in 1493 saw the expulsion of the Jews by the Catholic Spanish Inquisition, which rocked Western Europe. The second coincided with the establishment of the State of Israel after thousands of years of struggle in 1949, and the last one strangely occurred in 1967, far earlier than expected, precisely at the time of the Six-Day War, the Arab-Israeli War. So, according to the Israel-obsessed Pastor John Hagee, according to biblical prophecy, world history is about to change dramatically. The first of the four blood moons will come on April 15th this year during Passover, and the second will be on October 8th at the time of the Feast of the Tabernacles. So, James, we'll wrap this up with a a little bit of reality here. On April 4th, 2015, during Passover, we will have another blood, or rather 2015, have another blood moon, then on September 28th, as we noted, 2015, during that year's Feast of the Tabernacles, the fourth and final blood red moon will dawn. While NASA has confirmed the astrological validity behind some of the claims, not everyone is convinced the Tetrad means anything at all, let alone the end of days. Pastor, pa- professor, rather, he's not a pastor, he's a professor, Gary Shogren, a former pastor who studied New Testament at Aberdeen University said, you'll never go broke predicting the apocalypse. An eclipse on Passover night seems wildly improbable, but we should remember that lunar eclipses only happen on full moons anyway, and that Passover by definition takes place on a full moon. Sukkoth, or the previously mentioned Feast of the Tabernacles, also by definition coincides with a full moon. Professor Shogren thought we would have learned our lesson by listening to Harold Camping over the last few years. This is really no different this time, James. It's interesting how that just that little bit of extra information tends to put it into perspective, uh-huh. doesn't it? And uh, and I guess there are three ways of looking at this story. The first story is to take it at face value as a fulfillment of some sort of biblical prophecy. Um, and uh, I, I mean, if everything is faded in the stars, then why are we even here talking about yep. it? We should be off partying because whatever's going to happen is going to happen. So I would look at it that way. But even if you wanted to take it as fulfillment of biblical prophecy, there is no biblical prophecy of a tetrad falling on the Passover or anything like that. This is all be coming from very nebulous language, like Joel 2.31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord comes, which, again, has happened numerous times in, in the last 2,000 years, and this is just another uh, instance of that. So, again, every time something like this happens that can vaguely fall into line with prophecy, people will say it's the end of the world. Um, so, I, again, how many times can you cry wolf before people stop believing you? I think the second level of analysis would be to say, well, there are people in positions of power who really do believe in this type of stuff and believe in in astrology and, and things like this, that fate really is in the stars and the movements of, uh, of the planets and things like this. And we can look at, for example, Reagan, who demonstrably, uh, on the record, did time the exact moment of the beginning of uh, certain key speeches or the exact moment of wheels up of Air Force One and other things uh, based on the astrological charts of his astrologer, which has uh, been documented in the past, which, when you think about it, is a pretty amazing national security issue, um, if for no other reason than imagine if 
the Russians at the height of the Cold War, or whatever you want to talk about it, the, the enemies of the United States, found out that that's what Reagan was doing, that he was going off of astrological charts for certain movements. That would be a pretty important piece of information for some enemy to get their hands on, wouldn't it? So I, I, even from that perspective, it's a, it's a bit ridiculous. But uh, um, it, it, these people, maybe they really believe it, so they really will start something on one of these types of events. The third level of analysis is they don't believe it, but they know a lot of people out there believe it, and thus will use this as a conduit to bring in certain events that people are already programmed, have already been told to believe, well, this is the end of the world, so we better we better get ready for it. And when it happens, people will go, oh, I guess it's the end of the world. Um, so there's, there's at least those three levels of analysis to look at with this, which is why I think it's interesting and why I think it's important that we all take a step back, even the people who do believe this is some sort of biblical prophecy, take a step back and wonder it, how to what extent are we being played and how are our expectations of these types of events being played? Because again, um, every generation generation of Christianity since the time of Christ has believed that it's going to be, you know, any day now he's coming back. And, uh, and if they are going according to this script, then they can manipulate people's expectations. And on that very note, in fact, I'll throw in a link to uh, a, a expose of Operation Bluebeam that was uh, up on Intel Hub. Uh, dot com just uh, last week. It's not an alien inv- invasion. It's Operation Bluebeam. I think it's a similar thing. If they can, uh, if they can get people to believe in the alien invasion, then they can manipulate our expectations of that. If they can get us to believe in this apocalypse, then they can manipulate our expectations of that. And the final thing I'll say is, in response to at the second going on Twitter once again, who said uh, in reply to the post on Twitter that I made of this, he said, "Apocalypse actually means revelation, not the end of the world." Which is technically true, but unfortunately, language, um, once you use it incorrectly, long enough and often enough, it becomes correct. (laughs) So, in fact, now part of the dictionary definition of apocalypse is the end of the world. So, take it for what it's worth. (laughs) James, you're literally right. (laughs) <laughs> Speaking of misusing words, and have, having said all of that, we'll wrap this episode up, James, by noting a few other unrelated news submissions on Twitter using hashtag New World Next Week from our old friend at G.J. Salisbury. Italy's bishops pass Vatican-backed rule that child molestation does not have to be reported. And also a triathlete injured by a hacked camera drone, which is a fascinating story, And one submitted just a couple of hours ago at Porkins Policy in a story that has just broke here recently. Eric Haroun, the American jihadist who fought in Syria, dies suddenly for no apparent reason. All of that and so much more you can find on Twitter using hashtag New World Next Week and going to newworldnextweek.com for the new dedicated RSS feed. And you can find the show now on iTunes. We are back up and running, James, and I'm always glad to be here with you. Me too. Looking forward to next week. Thank you again. Thanks.